Hey TPT sellers, let's talk today about whether TPT niches are an outdated strategy or whether they're still relevant today. My name is Mike Fuchigami. I'm the host of the SUTpreneur community. We're gonna go through four things. We're gonna talk about the danger of niche hopping. We're gonna talk about when we need to be patient and when we need to pivot. We're gonna ask what's your why and how that relates to your niche. And then we're gonna look at some tips from Deanna Jump about how to make a million bucks. There's this saying in the larger business community, the riches are in the niches. Is it niche? Is it niche? You know what I mean. The riches are in the niches. And so then by extension, the riches are in the TPT niches. I listened to Alex Hermosi in one of his books. He talks about how in his mastermind groups, he says, don't make me niche slap you. Alex Hermosi has a net worth of $100 million. He seems to know something about success in business. And this is what he's telling his mastermind group. Don't make me niche slap you. Stop looking around and focus on one niche. Seth Godin has a net worth of $50 million and he's attributed with saying, everyone is not your customer. And I think in TPT land, we want to sell to all grade three teachers. And Meredith Hale says, when you speak to everyone, you speak to no one. I saw this in a video about how to focus to your YouTube audience. Basically the idea was, if you are talking about Star Trek and then you release a video about Star Wars, those are two very different audiences. Even though in your head, you might be thinking this is really the same audience because it's space and it's science fiction. Really, the people who love Star Trek love Star Trek. And the people who love Star Wars love Star Wars. So everyone is not your audience. When you speak to everyone, you speak to no one. I found a website article by Jonathan Stroud, who is part of Alex Hermosi's mastermind group. And he talks about the niche hopping mistake and how he heard about it, how he didn't want to believe it, and how he still followed this niche hopping mistake for years. He has a Facebook lead generation agency. That just basically means he finds companies and he runs Facebook ads for them. Initially, his story goes that he ran Facebook ads for anyone and everyone who wanted it. So he ran Facebook ads for chiropractors, for dentists, for gyms, everyone. And he was making $100,000 per year. Then he decided to focus on one specific niche. He liked the jujitsu clients. So he started focusing exclusively on that niche. And his income went from $100,000 per year to 100,000 per month. Let's look at this danger of niche hopping. Google tells me that a niche is a specialized segment of the market for a particular kind of product or service. The key takeaway for me is this word specialized. When you specialize, there's lower competition in your niche, but there's also less traffic. Less people are searching for specialized stuff, but the people who are searching for specialized stuff really want it. I think the danger in TPT land, but also the danger in the real world, is if you specialize too much, you might get zero search volume. Now, in TPT land, when we first start, our traffic comes from predominantly the TPT search engine, which means that our traffic is predominantly 80% American. I'll talk more about that later. On the other side of the coin, we have generalists. If you're in the general market, you compete with everyone. There's a lot of competition out there, a lot of existing established players who are selling to general markets. There's higher competition, but there's higher search volume. So there's a bigger pie. And if you can get a tiny slice of that big pie, well, it's a big pie. So then it's worth a lot of money. The flip side is it might be impossible to crack into a generalist market. You've heard this before, being a generalist, it's like digging a hole a mile wide, but an inch deep. Whereas if you're a specialist, you're digging a hole an inch wide, a mile deep. This is what it might look like if you're a generalist, right? If we go back to the metaphor about TPT products being seeds, you're planting a lot of grass seeds and you get tiny blades of grass across a large spectrum of area, maybe pre-K to grade 12. A specialist approach, if we take that seed metaphor, it might be like planting a seed which has a really deep root that eventually becomes a tree. And once you're successful in your niche, you can start to branch out. There's nothing wrong with that. Amazon started by only selling books online and then they became successful in that they had developed the infrastructure to be able to expand. So I wonder how can we take those lessons from the outside world and apply them to TPT land? The hard part, for teachers and for the real world is that 
We're worried that if we niche down, we have this fear of missing out. We're worried we're gonna lose sales in other areas. Even though we know about stories like Jonathan Stroud where when he sold to everyone, dentists, chiropractors, gyms, he was making $100,000 per year. When he specialized just to jujitsu clients, he was able to basically 10X his income and make $100,000 per month. We hear stories about this, but it's still hard. We don't want to miss out. But if we specialize, then we can have targeted messaging direct to your audience. A few weeks ago, I published a press release and now I get spam from other press release companies. Today I got a message and the email subject was, don't read this if you're happy with your current newswire. So instantly in the first few seconds, I knew I was not the audience for this because I'm not going to be sending out a lot of news releases. But if you send out lots of news releases and you're not happy with your news wire, then instantly you're paying attention. So the benefit to specializing is you can have targeted messaging. And because you focus, you can understand the needs of your market better. I taught grade eight for 13 years. I understand grade eight land. I create content for grade eight teachers. If I sold resources to kindergarten, that is not my audience. I don't understand their world at all. And yes, for a whim, I created a resource for grades one to four, like a student-led conference script for elementary grades, just because I was tinkering. And sure, this month, I had a few sales of that resource, but I don't really understand the primary world. That's not my world. If I generalize and I spend a little bit of time learning about each grade, I'm missing out on the opportunity to become an expert in grade eight. Another benefit to specializing is then your resources become all grade eight related. I'm not talking about the resources you sell. I'm talking about the tools and the resources and the assets that you have to create TPT resources. In the lower grades, I see a lot of fantastic clip art used on, on product covers because that sells. That's cute. That's what the market wants. So then you start getting clip art, but clip art for high school and clip art for elementary grades are very different. If you specialize, then you're investing in only the clip art for your grade levels. I'm a tech person, so I'll explain it in a tech way. I know Macs are better, but I have so much experience in the Windows world. I have so much software for Windows. I know all the keyboard shortcuts for Windows. I'm very comfortable, comfortable, interesting word, right? I'm very comfortable with Windows. And because all of my computers use Windows, I don't want to switch and niche down into Mac. That would not be a good niche for me to get into, which is funny because I have an iPhone. All the money I've spent on iPhone apps, I don't want to switch over to Android or use both. If I buy an app for Android, I can't use that app for iPhone. I want to specialize what resources I have, which is iPhone. So now I have Windows and iPhone, even though if I had Mac and iPhone, they would play much nicer together. I think the goal of niching down is to become the go-to person for your very specific niche. That way, people in your niche trust you. You are absolutely what they're looking for because you only talk about that. I can kind of see this in my YouTube channel. I only talk about TPT as a platform for my journey. I don't talk about online tutoring. I don't talk about Etsy. But when you see my thumbnail come up, you know I'm gonna talk about TPT. You know it's gonna be probably analytical. You know I try to keep calm in the face of drama. And you know I love interacting with you in the comments. And as I'm talking right now, I realize the stuff that I talk about TPT blogs, the general stuff will fit because it's TPT land. But I think the hyper-focused stuff on, on WordPress, I wonder if I need to save that for my SEOT hosting channel. This is where that tip for new YouTube influencers, like if you're talking about Star Trek, only talk about Star Trek. If you talk about Star Wars, only talk about Star Wars. If you wanna talk about both, put them in separate channels because then people know consistently what you create. So that's another benefit about niching down. But in reality, it's hard because we all have a fear of missing out. So then the question is, if things aren't working yet, do you have the patience to stick it through or is it time to pivot? And I actually need your help with this question. 
So let's look at a case study. I'm not sure if pivoting down is working for me and I need you, the SEOTpreneur YouTube community, to give me an outsider perspective. I'm also gonna talk about this in tomorrow, Saturday, February 17th on the SEOTpreneur Pro side because a few of us are thinking about niching or selling into multiple markets. So I'm curious to hear what you think. Is it working for me? Here's my niche right now. English language arts, middle school grade sevens and eight, reading comprehension with a digital literacy and a diversity take, focusing on social emotional learning because that's what I'm passionate about, social emotional learning. And lately, I've been trying to niche down into Ontario, which is the province that I live in. And I'm not sure whether niching down into Ontario is a mistake or not. And I need your help to figure this out. I got this idea from some of the conversations I had at TPT Forward last year. I think is to really niche down. I met a few different in that third milestone category where they sell content specific to their state or their province curriculum. So they're not selling to the entire country or, or to the US. Wherever they happen to teach, they create their subject matter specifically for that curriculum. And then in their product description, they're describing what that curriculum is. If I had a time machine and I can go back, or if I see these sellers again at TPT Forward 2024, by the way, are you going? I've already bought my ticket to San Diego. I have reserved my hotel and I paid for my flight. So if you're going, I'd love to chat with you there. But if I had a time machine or if I see these sellers again, I'd like to ask them, if they started focusing only on their state or province, or did they start as a generalist creating content everywhere and then niche down? And my guess chatting with multiple people on the TPT journey is they started just creating content and then over time realized a lot of their sales were coming from their state and then they just niche down to their state or province. That's my guess. So after TPT Forward at the start of September, I started this experiment to try to niche down to Ontario. In Ontario 2023, the government launched a new curriculum. I, real, I realize now after chatting with Paula that Americans and Canadians, or at least people in Ontario, we use the word curriculum differently. For us, curriculum means state standards. Whereas I think curriculum for you means like long-term lesson plans or units. Either way, in September 2023, Ontario released a new set of standards for us to teach in language. So I, I started to niche down and focus my messaging on Ontario in my titles and in my covers and my product descriptions and my categories. Here are my sales in Ontario this year. So the past five months since September. So September 23, October, November, December, January, and then this month, February 2024. So in Ontario, it's hard to tell from this, but it went down, but you would naturally expect sales to go down in December because I don't have a lot of December seasonal stuff. And then I have more sales in January and February. The dotted line shows my sales in Ontario last year, the same period. So I can see in October, the solid green line is higher. So I sold more in October. So it seems like, yay, niching down to Ontario is working. But then I don't really see that in November, December, January, February. Maybe in October, the sales boost was because I had an email newsletter. Here are some free resources for the Ontario language curriculum. I don't know. The solid red line shows my sales in the US this year. So this is showing me my TPT earnings. You can see in December, December is my low month. And then January is my high month. And the province of Ontario is tiny compared to all of the people in all of the states in the US. So that's something to think about too. And finally, the dotted red line shows you my sales in the US last year, this time period. And when I look at this, my sales in the US have dropped. And the question for me is, did they drop because I've started in September to focus on Ontario or did they drop for another reason? Carrie had a really good point, which I hadn't really thought about. Hey, Carrie, thanks a lot. Uh, her point was, could it be that the topics of your reading passages were more relevant last year than this year? Like if the topics were more aligned to what was going on in the real world last year versus this year. And she's 100% right. Like some of my articles are dated. So that, that comment actually made me think, okay, I could update some of the core products in that bundle. She's not wrong. There could be other reasons for the dips compared to last year. But I try to look for patterns in the data. If I combine my sales from the last five months, you can see that the American market 
is roughly 10 times the size of my Ontario market. And for my US sales on TPT, compared with last year, I'm down 3,000. Whereas on the Ontario side, compared to last year, I'm only up 360 bucks. So this makes me wonder, should I really continue to niche down to Ontario if it seems like I'm losing sales in the American market? Normally, I would say, yes, okay, it's time to pivot. But earlier this month, in our Thursday grind sessions, there's always a quote. And the quote was, patience, persistence, and perspiration make an unbeatable combination for success from Napoleon Hill, who talked with a bunch of millionaires. And his net worth is anywhere from 1 million to 20 million, depending on which article you read. This idea about patience and knowing that some sellers have hit the third milestone just by niching down into a state or province, it makes me wonder if I need to be more patient. And what I don't know is if those TPT sellers who niche down to their state or province, did they do that before they had their first milestone, let's say? So were they just tinkering around? They weren't getting a lot of sales anyway, and then they niched down to their state or province. And then because they were only known for that, they started to gain traction. They didn't have existing buyers from other states or provinces. Or or were they like me where they're past the second milestone? I think the second milestone is 70 grand, 75 grand. Let me know in the comments. I don't remember. But were these sellers who who hyper-focused on their state or province, did they niche down once they were established And then did they lose sales like I am? Although I often talk about how I never go into TPT land and how I like to learn from business people outside, there is value in chatting with experienced people in TPT land, like people ahead of me in the game who have done this and they're able to share their TPT land specific expertise. I can't just go into the TPT forums trying to hunt down these people. I think general questions, I think there's a lot of noise. So that's what keeps me outside here in TPT land. But I actually love that here in the YouTube community, we're building a little bit of expertise and people are sharing their thoughts. So here's my question to you. Should I stay with the Ontario marketing because I'm trying to resonate more with Ontario teachers? Like, hey, Ontario middle school teachers and friends. Or should I pivot back, remove the Ontario specific language and focus on middle school English language arts teachers who who see the importance of digital literacy, diversity, equity, and social emotional learning. So all of these teachers around the world, no matter where you are, instead of just in Ontario, what would you do? Leave a comment. Oh, I have another question. I was chatting with Andrea yesterday and her question was maybe stating common core isn't a good thing. And she suggested I ask you, the YouTube community, whether or not Common Core attracts teachers or repels teachers. So if you saw this resource, and at the top I have new Ontario language in red, and then in December I added plus Common Core, because I didn't want to scare off my American friends, does adding Common Core actually repel people? Or does it attract people? Let me know what you think about advertising Common Core as a good thing or a bad thing. For the data-minded people, I started the Common Core marketing in December and December is right here. I'm not sure that we have enough data. It might be too early to see if there's a change. I mean, there's less of a gap. In November, it looks like I was down by a thousand, but in January, it looks like I was down by a couple hundred. February's not finished yet, but it's not looking that great. I'd like to spend a little bit of time looking at why we do what we do And does our niche tie into our why? And if you're new to thinking about your why, check out Simon Sinek, Start With Why. He explains his whole thinking behind that. I started thinking about my why when I was doing some research for this video, and I came across an article in 2012 about about Deanna Jump's advice for TPT sellers. I don't know Deanna Jump yet, but she's a little bit of a TPT hero. She's the first TPT seller to hit the million dollar mark, but As I learned more about her, I think she's a little bit of a personal hero for me as well. She's a little bit of who I want to be. Here's why. These are the stages of a TPT teacherpreneur that I talk about in masterclass number two. Deanna Jump is the only TPT seller that I would put in the planet category. I define a TPT planet as you're so big that people have heard about you outside of our space. See what I did there? Space, planet. Yeah, okay. Because you are so big, you have your own gravitational pull. 
How many of us have gone to Deanna Jump's store and followed her because of who she is? She's inspiring because she provides proof of concept. She shows us what is possible in TPT land. As we start to think, well, if she can do it, I can do it too. It can be done. Making a million dollars on the Teachers Pay Teachers platform is possible. She did it first in 2012, but obviously there have been many more people who've done it since. So this resonates with me because my strategy to become a planet is to be so good you can't ignore me. Why do I want to be so good that you can't ignore me? Because if I am that good that you can't ignore me, then it puts a spotlight on my advocacy work for mental health. Teaching can be really tough. It's change. You have to do everything. And to be honest, as teacherpreneurs, this is probably a good thing because this is our market. We know that teaching is tough. We know that teachers don't have time to create the awesome lessons that they want to. So by creating incredible value and exchanging it for money, we're able to solve their problem and earn a living. But I think the angle that we're missing is who's doing social emotional learning for teachers? And the answer is we need to do our own social emotional learning. Sure, the school district might do a workshop for you once or twice or maybe never. But if we take responsibility for our own social emotional learning, then we take more control of what happens to us, of our story. I believe that being a teacherpreneur, selling on TPT, is the ultimate social emotional learning for teachers. Because it's not easy. We're not the expert. We're not at the front of the class anymore. We're trying to learn a new skill that doesn't work. It's frustrating. Things change. I just want someone to give me the answer. But the reality is, the answer is different for everyone. And that's, that's the real world. So if you're just watching right now and you're on this TPT journey and you like what I've said so far, hit that subscribe button so we can learn a little bit about ourselves as we go on this journey towards financial freedom. Class of Excellence recently left me a huge compliment which is one thing that I learned from you is to try new things and don't be afraid from failure. That is like, like class of excellence. If you're watching this, that is huge. I love that me publicly making mistakes and tinkering around is sort of inspiring other people to, oh, maybe it's okay to make mistakes and let's just see what happens. And it probably won't work, but it might work. It might work. And either way, even if it doesn't work, we'll learn something from it, right? Like, I think that's the attitude we need to have in order to succeed as teacherpreneurs. And that's what I mean when I say social emotional learning for teachers. We can become more aware about ourselves and our choices and how we act as we try to make money on teachers pay teachers. It's kind of cool. But if I am so good that you can't ignore me, then you won't be able to ignore my advocacy work for student mental health. And as I talk about my why, what motivates me, think about what motivates you, and then think about how that ties into your TPT products. I'm gonna guess that whatever motivates you drives the kind of teacher you are. And those are your people that you need to niche down to. Stories matter because stories show us what's possible. And I used to think about this as inspiring the good, but now I realize it could also inspire other things. So back when I was in the classroom, my school did a lesson on bullying and they tied it into the elementary mental health curriculum. And in this lesson, a bullied kid comes to school and shoots his bullies. And that's the end of the lesson. Students aren't allowed to ask questions because they're dismissed. The school refused to tell the parents about what they just taught their students. And I had a mental health crisis. I have anxiety, I have paranoia, I have depression, and I went to some pretty dark places. And throughout those dark times, and even now because it's a journey, right? But my question was, how do you turn your worst moments into your best moments? This is why social emotional learning is so important for me, right? Because I have lived experience where the 6C skills that I was teaching in my classroom just before my crisis, those got me through some tough days. That's why I create SEL resources. That's why I see selling on TPT as not only a journey for financial freedom, but also a journey in personal growth. My goal is to become a positive story because I think we need real stories about mental health instead of sensational school lessons about bully kids shooting their bullies. If I'm so good, you can't ignore me. If I become the Jerry Seinfeld of teacherpreneurs, where I am that good at tinkering and experimenting and successful, that you can't ignore me, 
then I'm a story of someone who struggles with mental health and has a successful ending. And it's an ongoing journey, but that's the point. Selling on TPT is an ongoing journey. There are ups and downs. You never just make it because even if you're a whale and you're at the top of the game, there are always new people coming up in the market. So that's my goal. If I am so good, you can't ignore me, then you won't be able to ignore the press release I put out in January 2024. Ontario School refuses to inform parents about school shooting lesson and Ontario courts uphold decision. Deanna Jump inspires me because she provides proof of concept about what can be done in TPT land. And my goal is to become that proof of concept as well. I'm on my own journey to turn my worst moments into my best moments. It's going to be different for everyone, but how can I turn things around? If you're a teacher, well, then maybe hanging out with us on your TPT journey, you might pick up a few things here and there. And I'm not talking about computer skills or, or TPT SEO tricks. So let's dive into that Deanna Jump article about what she says about finding a niche. I'm going to go through a few of the tips that she had in 2012. The article was published in EdSurge and I'll put a link in the video description. It's about top 10 tips to make a million bucks. And this is just commentary. It's just analysis of the public record. Her first point is to stay true. And she talks about the importance of staying true to your teaching philosophy. And I think this ties into your why. Why are you a teacher? What is your why? Start with why. Because it probably ties into your teaching philosophy. And then we need to make that trickle down into our teacherpreneur philosophy. But she uses all of the materials in her own classroom. That's how she knows she has a good product. Do you know if your TPT products actually work? I don't. I'm not in the classroom right now. I'm creating resources based on my understanding of the grade eight classroom from five years ago. So I don't have the kind of feedback you get from your students when you teach a lesson and you know they're bored and it's not working. I don't know that about my lessons. Are you currently using the TPT products that you make? If you are, you have a huge advantage over everyone and the issue now is marketing. But if you don't teach the content you make, you're at a disadvantage because you don't actually know if it works. You just think it works. And we've all had lessons that we think are going to be epic. And then we teach them in the classroom and it's a flop. Her second point is to link it to the Common Core. I think this was at a time where the Common Core was just getting introduced. And when I read the article, it sounded like she was ahead of the curve and linking it to standards in the Common Core before they came out. But the point about connecting your TPT products with standards that teachers have to teach, I think that's important because that's a pain point. I have to teach the standards and expectations that the government tells me to teach. And if you tell me your resource helps me teach that, boom, that's a huge selling point. So now I wonder about your marketing of your TPT products. Are your TPT products just for fun or do they also meet educational standards? And they might be both, right? There's a place for both. And that really depends on your niche. But I think it's important to connect your resources to the state standards. Not everyone will, and this helps set you apart. If you're an American teacher, you probably have an advantage because you're familiar with the Common Core state standards. 81% of the traffic on TPT comes from the US. If we look at SEMrush data here, 2.9 million visits from the states. The runner up is the Canadian market. So the Canadian market counts for 5.7% of TPT. And then third is India, which is 2.2% of visits, which is kind of cool. I would not have thought that. Based on my sales data, I would have guessed Australia or England or New Zealand. But, but recently I've noticed that my sales have dropped from Australia and New Zealand and the UK. Maybe there's something here, but we would have to dig into the SEMrush data more to see if that's true. Deanna Jump's third point is to put in the time. I thought it was interesting that it takes her 40 to 50 hours of computer time to create her units. She says a unit is two weeks of material. That's 40 to 50 hours to produce 10 lessons, four to five hours per lesson of computer time. How much time do you spend on your lessons? And I'm not talking about at the beginning because at the beginning that you're creating a product line, you're still figuring things out and it takes a lot more time. But as you create more products in that product line, you become more efficient and you realize, oh, this is how I can do things and I can optimize what you do. But Deanna Jump says at the bottom here, don't cut any corners. And I think that's an interesting idea because it makes me wonder if she knows a lot of TPT sellers do cut corners. The fourth tip that she gives is to find a niche. This is from 2012. 
And let's put aside the idea that we have that, oh, well, she was at the, she was at the beginning of the game and she was able to get in when there was less competition. Yeah, sure, there was less competition back then, but there was also less search volume, right? It was a smaller marketplace. All of the successful teachers that you see on TPT today, it's not luck and it's not because they got in early. It's because they've been working really, really hard to become that successful. You have to constantly work and run to keep up. So Deanna Jump talks about how her niche is to create these lessons with higher order thinking skills. I think that's what she's passionate about. What I found interesting was that she solved her own problem. At the time, she talks about how kindergartens don't have the kinds of resources that grade level teachers do. So she started to make her own. She had a problem. She couldn't find a solution to the problem. So she started making the solution to her problem. And then she started selling that solution to other people. I think that's important. Some of us are coming at it from the opposite end where we try to guess which market is easier to sell into as opposed to solving problems. Like I can't find this kind of resource. I've looked everywhere for this. It's so frustrating. I can't find this on TPT. Oh, when I put up a product like that on TPT, it's sold. Okay. That's my niche. Boom. Because you have lived experience, not being able to find what you needed. And chances are other people are like you. They also need that. Now I've heard this idea out there. You know what? This is old advice. It's not working. And to that, I have to say maybe because if Alex Harmozy, who is in the hundred million dollar club is telling other entrepreneurs, don't make me niche slap you, find a niche, then finding a niche is key to success. If we look at Jonathan Stroud, yes, he made more money niching down into a jujitsu market for his Facebook ad company. But that's not to say he made no money when he was a generalist. He still made a hundred thousand per year when he was selling to everyone. So I imagine if we think about this as grades, as niches, if I say that you don't niche down to grade eight or one grade level or like a division that you won't make money, well, we know that's not true because there are sellers who sell from K to 12 who do make money. But I wonder about the Amazon example where they started with just books and then they expanded to selling everything. I wonder then for me, if I just start with SEL for grade seven, eight, and then once they become really known and successful there, then start to build my brand and start to, you know, get bigger and create other content. Maybe that's something in the future. Who knows? If we just look at these four points that Deanna Jump gave us, and if we start to think, well, it's not working anymore. Maybe this is old advice. Maybe. But my first question now would be, are you using the resources you sell in your classroom? That was her tip number one. I'm not. Maybe that's why I'm having problems niching down into Ontario. Are you linking to your state standards? Yes, this one I'm doing. Are you spending four to five hours per lesson? This is tip number three. And this one I would say yes to. My critical thinking line is about seven hours, eight hours for me to produce. I'm on critical thinking puzzle number 11 out of 100. So I'm still tweaking it along the way. Like I'm still finding my style and figuring out how to make it most useful for teachers. In the comments, and I would love for you to challenge what I've said in this video, and I'd love to gently challenge some of your ideas. Do you think niching down works? Why or why not? And by niching down, I don't mean niche hopping. So niche hopping is when you try first, I'll try this niche and then I'll try that niche and then I'll try selling to dentists and then I'll try selling to chiropractors and then I'll try selling to gyms and then I'll try selling to, right? It's about like, okay, finding that niche that you like, finding your why and then just digging straight down. So leave a comment. Tell me if you think niches in TPT work. And I would love to know if you think the common core attracts or repels teachers. And I'm not talking about checking off which standards it meets. I'm talking about explicitly putting common core on your product title or in your product covers. If you like watching me make mistakes, check out this video. YouTube thinks you should watch this video and I'll see you next time.